All right. Thank you, John, very much. And thanks, everybody, for, for being here. i um, very excited to be able to represent, uh, present today on tenant rights and drafting an enforceable lease. Um, I want to say at the outset, it was really a pleasure working with Stephanie, um, who's an attorney out of our Williamsport office. She's uh, really great on these issues. Um, she's a great presenter. Um, so and she's a very considerate attorney. So we're glad to have her on our side. Um, I work out of our Scranton office. My name's Stephen Fernando. Um, and we're presenting today, we, we try to, what we try to do is interlay um, specific lease clauses or examples of lease clauses throughout our presentation of substantive law. So as to give um, examples of different kinds of things we see on a daily basis. Um, good examples uh, we've put in here, we've put bad examples or egregious examples, and then um, middle of the road, typical examples, um, just so you have a good sense of what it is to be a housing lawyer um, with and dealing with leases on a daily basis. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to send it to Stephanie to get things started. Thank you, Stephen. That was really nice of you. Uh, Stephen's got the experience. I have the PowerPoint here. So uh, between the two of us, we'll be well covered today. Uh, we're going to go over briefly the controlling statutes for landlord-tenant law. You know, it goes outside of just the Landlord-Tenant Act in Pennsylvania. Um, and then we're going to get into lease formation and lease terms. Um, and as you mentioned, as we go through these different topics that usually come up as issues in litigation, we have some examples of real leases that our clients have had um, to kind of show you what you have to deal with. Because, you know, when we know that private attorneys sometimes end up with the short end of the stick. Um, you're just getting the landlord coming to you once there's already an issue. You don't necessarily get to draft a lease. Um, but hopefully after today, you'll be well prepared to prepare good leases that keep you out of court, ideally. <laughs> um, and then at the very end, we'll go through how to terminate a lease and what that can look like. So here's the controlling statutes that attorneys should look through. Um, obviously, the Landlord-Tenant Act applies, but there's a couple other things that attorneys should be aware of when they're preparing leases and when you're going through any sort of litigation. Um, so obviously, leases are contracts. They fall under the statute of frauds in Pennsylvania. Um, Plain Language Act, that's very important while drafting. Um, the Unfair Trade Practices and Consumer Protection Act, manufactured homes. So if you have a mobile home park, there's extra protection for those people who own their homes. And then the Fair Housing Act will apply to landlords who have over a certain amount of houses that they rent out and don't also live in. Um, so just be aware if you're counseling a, a private attorney, uh, counseling a private landlord on these issues, there's more to look at than just the Landlord-Tenant Act. So with that, um, this is our first uh, lease sample clause here. So this is, uh, we mentioned mobile homes. Um, so with respect to mobile homes, one of the first things we think of are, are community rules, right? There's typically in most mobile home communities, a set of rules that are attached. So this is a good typical um, rules clause, nothing too crazy here, um, except to say that um, the you'll notice in the very first line, the rules are supposed to be attached as exhibit A. So this was a case of mine in this particular mobile home case, the rules were not attached as, as exhibit A. Right. So that was something to think about. Um, does it make the clause or the lease unenforceable? Probably not. Right. But it's something to think, you know, did the maybe it gives the client a little leeway if there was a violation or something like that. So, again, just to get things started with these samples, it, what all of these come down to, and I probably read like dozens of leases uh, in preparing for this, but it comes down to communication, which is what a contract I think is supposed to be. Right. Um, proper communication before between the landlord and the tenant gives everybody an idea of what their rights and responsibilities are. And in a poorly drafted lease or a lease that's missing an exhibit or a clause or something like that, that communication breaks down and that's where um, lawyers get paid. That's why we have litigation, right? Um, so that's our first lease example here. And as many people have probably found out, the Landlord Tenant Act doesn't exactly describe what is a lease. Um, we'll have the rules in here throughout the presentation of the laws that apply um, default rules if there is not a lease. So what the Pennsylvania law requires, even without a written contract. Um, but even if you should check to see if your clients, even with a contract, it doesn't necessarily say like a rental agreement or lease agreement. Um, people who stay at hotels for long periods of time or rooming houses, Pennsylvania courts have held those to be landlord-tenant relationships. 
Um, so if you're looking to enforce any sort of contract and it, you can make that argument that, that it creates a landlord tenant relationship um, going over what, you know, do they pay you rent monthly? What are exchanges for that? Um, even people who don't pay rent, there's cases that show um, if they have that duty of something else that replace the rent, like cleaning or um, some other sort of service to the landowner, uh, Pennsylvania courts have held that that shows a landlord tenant relationship and therefore that person receiving the benefit, even though it's not necessarily rent money, that they are a landlord and has to follow the Landlord Tenant Act then. Uh, first thing on a lease is always who's it between, right? So that contract is going to lay out who's a landlord, who's a tenant. Um, best case, you know, you always want to prepare that as saying how many people are living in the house and what the names of the parties are. Um, usually this comes up as an issue in litigation when one of the parties, so say you have a husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, one of them obtains a protection order against the other. So the other person is excluded out of the home by the PFA. Um, we have some good lease examples following this, kind of the cover the landlord in that situation, um, because a lot of times landlords feel stuck when they don't know what to do in the court's ordering someone to leave, but one person has the right to be there. Um, so if you can put in some sort of language to kind of preempt that, that's best practice. Um, PFAs are obviously different than divorce. Um, no one in divorce court is excluding someone from a premises based on protection. Um, and another issue we run in regularly is the sale of the property by the landlord. Um, a lot of people think that if they're going to sell the property, then they have to term or maybe also some real estate agents fall into this. Um, they think that all leases should be terminated prior to or as of the building is being sold. So that's not true. Um, the Chapel case clearly, clearly states it's been cited over and over again since 1936, um, that if there's an existing lease, it continues on with that new property owner. And that new owner assumes all the rights and responsibilities of that former landlord. Um, so if they signed an annual lease, the, the client's there, the tenant's there for the remainder of that year. Um, if it's month to month, that's different, but they still have to follow the same uh, landlord tenant responsibilities. Um, it's also best practice, um, we've seen this a couple of times, that the new owners get, um, have the tenants sign what's called an estoppel certificate. So essentially the new owners will go through, do a walkthrough with a tenant, see what the issue is, um, if there's any sort of habitability or maintenance issues fix them and then say, you know, we fix this, this is how you're accepting the property in this kind of new start with this new owner. Um, it's not a new lease. It's just um, acknowledging that any defenses or issues have been brought up and kind of quashed then between the new parties. So Stephanie mentioned PFAs and, and family law issues. Um, this is a lease sample from a, a popular real estate website and actually in one of their model leases that they use, but it actually um, considers DV protection in a private context, which is pretty great um, to have something because, you know, um, in a housing context or public housing context, there may be other kinds of protections for domestic violence victims under the VAWA Act, Violence Against Women's Act, but not so much in the private landlord tenant relationship. But here's just an example. Again, I'd like to give you good examples, too, of clauses and things like that. But this says if the tenant is a victim of family violence or reasonably believes it's necessary to vacate the property due to a fear of imminent domestic um, harm, um, the tenant, and, and et cetera, the ten tenant may terminate the lease by providing landlord 30 days prior to written notice. So it's not a lot of protection, but it's something. And we very rarely see something like this in a lease that gives domestic violence victims some kind of protection. So I thought this was interesting and a pretty novel and great example of a clause. And I think that one's a pretty good example because it doesn't specifically say that they need to get a protection order. Because, you know, in different counties, some of them are harder to obtain than other counties. Um, so this is like the victim coming forward and saying, I no longer feel safe living here. I want to be off this lease. I plan on moving out in 30 days. And that's enough for that tenant to move out. They don't have to go through the court process and have it deemed a PFA by court in order to exercise this right. So I think it's particularly good. And yeah, it's great. That's great. Um, another example about the sale of property 
here, as Stephanie mentioned, um, typically when the, the property is sold, uh, it runs, the, the lease runs with the land. Here, there's not a lot of protections in this in this sample for the tenant, right? It just says that the, um, the tenant will receive written notice stating the name, address, and phone number of the new landlord and to whom to pay rent. Um, that's not that's not a lot of clear protection, right? We don't know how much notice there is. Um, so it creates some gray area and probably an example of a poorly drafted um, lease clause for what happens in the sale. Um, it also contemplates the purchaser can end this lease in all mortgages. Um, so that creates a conflict with the chapel case, chapel case that Stephanie mentioned, right? And probably something that may be litigated should this situation come up where the property sold and the new owner wants to end the lease. Can it be? Um, can you contract that right away, that chapel right away? Um, it, it will probably have to be litigated. And here, um, Another just interesting example that I found in my research, but um, you, you want to talk about good communication and thinking, getting all of the possibilities into consideration. Here's a, a lease clause that contemplates the death of a tenant. Uh, it's very rare that I see something like this too, but it, it says specifically what should happen um, should the tenant pass away, which I mean, it doesn't happen too often, right? But it gives the new, the tenant's representative um, the right to terminate the lease within 14 days, uh, written notice. So um, maybe the estate or something like that won't be stuck with it. Again, it's not um, too common we see something like this, but it's just an interesting thing to consider too. If you wanted to go through all, all the things that you should contract, this is a situation you might want to consider. Yeah, so the next thing I usually have at the almost the top of a lease is how long a lease is or how long a lease term is for. Um, if that's not specified, if or you have an oral lease between parties, uh, Pennsylvania will hold that the lease renews for every term that you pay rent. So most people pay rent monthly, so it's going to act as a month-to-month -month lease then. Um, in the strange event that you pay month, you pay your rent in a large annual chunk, um, then that lease will be an annual lease. Um, when the term is specified, so say you have a, a lease that says July 1st to July 31st, um, it's gonna be renewing every month and you might have language in there, it's best practice to put something in there that says, this lease renews for a like term. Um, if it's an annual lease, a little easier for this, um, and it says it ends on the July 31st, 2024, um, and the someone is required to give notice that they're going to be moving out. After that, um, if they remain in possession, they said they're going to move out, they don't move out, that can be considered a holdover tenant. But most likely, um, and what we see most often, is that they renew the lease for a like term, and it's going to happen automatically, regardless whether the parties agree to it or give anybody some sort of writing that the lease is being renewed. Um, and we'll most likely often see this um, for a month-to-month -month lease in Pennsylvania. Right. So going along with that, right, um, this is a typical renewal clause. You have a one-year lease, and it clearly states what happens at the end of that year, right? When the lease term ends, it will re automatically renew in Part D for a term of one year. But if the landlord or tenant does not want to renew the lease, he, he must give the other 45 days written notice, which is a, a long notice period both ways here. So that's that could be good or bad protection for the tenant, depending on what their plans are. But um, this is an example of where that renewal clause is not silent, like Stephanie just said. Again, like she said, it's really important to look for that renewal clause if it's at the end of a lease term, right? It's a holdover tenant type situation. Because even a lot of people think if they've had a one-year lease, um, it becomes a month-to-month. -month, but unless that's in the lease itself, it's actually renewed for a year if it's silent as to what should happen, which is um, an important right we need to advise people of. Next, third thing on everyone's lease is usually how much is your rent? And like we saw in the previous uh, example, that gave an example of what your rent is for the year. Um, it's most often broke down to what it is monthly. Um, 
issues that we see most often, you know, everyone knows rent is due. It'll say what day it's due, uh, when it's considered late. You know, if like, there's a five day grace period, that's very normal. Um, if this happens very often with our clients, they have pay part of the rent. Maybe they pay every other paycheck, right? So they get paid bi-weekly and they give half of it over to the landlord at that time. If the landlord consistently accepts less than the full amount of rent in one payment, um, it really hinders their ability to demand rent in full on that due date and then not receiving it as a reason for eviction. Um, that's the Blue Ridge Metal case there. Um, if they're very, it, it needs to be a uh, consistent, not just a one-time thing. Uh, that's where it's kind of been um, kind of detailed out in the Ray case that it needs to be very consistent or if they're doing with other tenants, as well, that can really hurt the landlord's case of saying, you're late on rent, I'm evicting you. Um, with late rent, a lot of leases put in if there's fees involved. And the most important thing, and this is gonna be related back to the unfair trade practices law um, statute that should be considered while drafting leases, is that the late fee should be, to, to avoid it, should be a fixed amount. Um, it should not be, interpreted as a finance charge, because if it's being based upon like a percentage or um, some sort of equation of how much is owed, other than maybe a certain specific amount per day, um, then you're getting into, well, are you acting as a bank? Are you acting as a personal loan? You know, it gets into a little bit more difficult waters. Um, and it could be argued then by by attorneys that's not favorable for our clients and it's being a finance charge. The landlord is not um, following the proper laws and giving the proper disclosures for a finance charge. So there's a great explanation of this in the Edison Village case. Um, you're gonna wanna just, if you're preparing a lease, um, it has to be reasonable, right? It can't be excessive and unreasonable. So if you know you have to pay someone an extra hour to take that late check to the bank on a different day, um, you pay that person $15 an hour, okay, you're going to charge the tenant then $15 extra late fee. Um, if you're just counting up that every day it's going to be 5%, 5% of that accruing balance, that's excessive, right? You're not going to, anything that ends up being like half or more of that monthly rent is probably going to be knocked down by a court as being excessive. So it's hard for landlords to accept this sometimes, but the fee has to be reasonable. It has to be connected to a specific expense for them to be considered a, a normal late fee. Uh, the other thing we see pretty often in leases is that landlords will, so if you have a lease for a year, so you start in July, it ends at the end of June, and you put in a clause that demands that if the tenant moves out before that year ends, that they will still owe monthly rent for that entire term until the end of June. If the landlord evicts the tenant for non-payment of rent before that end of year, they cannot choose to evict them and collect that whole year's worth of rent. And that's the ever student housing case there. Um, they have to choose one or the other because just like traditional contract law, the party has to mitigate their damages. So they can either get all of it and let the person live there, <laughs> or they can evict them and re-rent the home to mi mitigate their damages. Going along with that, um, this is a typical uh, rent clause. Um, you uh, yep. Sorry, if you mind, I'm going to launch the first poll. Okay. Thanks, everybody. It'll be up for two minutes. Okay. Just click out of this. So this is a typical rent clause in a lease. Um, going along with the Evers case that Stephanie just mentioned, a lot of landlords think in part B here, right? It says the amount of total rent due during the term is $12,600. So if there's an eviction in the first month of that, they would like to accelerate all that rent and make it due, but you can't, right? Again, the Evers case, you have to choose between an eviction, removing the person and getting the total rent. So simply putting the total rent due over the entire term in the lease doesn't make the tenant liable in an eviction situation for the rest of it. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that, like she said, mitigation, um, but 
uh, this is just a, a thing we've been seeing, right? That, that landlords think they can accelerate all that rent. And by putting it in here clearly, they think they've created a right to it, which is not true. Okay. Um, similarly, if you fall behind in your rent or you owe your landlord money for some reason, um, bankruptcy is typically an option. This lease clause um, says the tenant understands and agrees that if the tenant files a petition for bankruptcy, it will not release the tenant from the fulfillment of the terms and conditions of the lease agreement. Um, again, great arguments that this is our uh, maybe our first example of really an unenforceable lease clause, right? It seeks to uh, basically supersede federal bankruptcy law in the lease, which you can't do. A couple examples of fines that someone might see that I thought were were strange. Um, this is actually at least from uh, my college apartment uh, when I was a student. But um, this uh, seeks to define, or it doesn't define, nuisances and assess charges for each offense. So first offense for a nuisance, right? Um, $150, then $200, then $500, things like that. Uh, but it doesn't, the problem is it doesn't define what a nuisance is exactly. Um, it says interfere, but it also distinguishes in paragraph 17 in my uh, college lease from criminal activity. So a nuisance is separate, I would argue, from criminal activity. So what is that, right? Is it just bothering someone else? Is it a, is a call um, going to mean I have to pay $150, um, maybe be evicted down the road? It's, it's not clear. So again, a, a lack of communication here um, is an example. Similarly, um, in another lease uh, we found are about police calls. Um, so uh, clause EE in this specifically says tenant agrees to an undetermined fine for each time an authority is called to the property and in parentheses they say police. Um, whole host of issues with a clause like this, right? I mean, an undetermined fine is probably unreasonable, right? Uh, maybe unconscionable. Um, Every time an authority is called, um, and it seems to specify police, but um, separately. So does that mean like the sewer authority, right? Or housing authority? Like, what does that mean exactly? Um, so is it just police? Is it not? There's a lot of lack of clarity in this lease clause that's going to lead to litigation and probably problems between the landlord and the tenant down the road, right? Which is what we're trying to avoid. So I would just encourage you to not draft something like this uh, moving forward. Um, and one of those examples that Stephen read, uh, his college one with the police coming and on the third violation, it says, you will not get back your security deposit, right? <laughs> um, so no rental payments or security deposits will be returned. When the security deposit law under Landlord Tenant Act um, 250.511, that one does not, you can't waive this, right? The, it very clearly states in there that a tenant cannot waive their rights to um, their security deposit once they move out. So even that part of <laughs> that poorly written lease will be void, completely void. Not that it's not valid, but it's going to be void and unenforceable. Um, so it's really nice to put in a lease so that way tenants and landlords are very clear about what their responsibilities are um, because they can't waive this right. So when someone moves out of an apartment, whether it's an eviction or a voluntary uh, vacate, it's going to be 30 days that the landlord has to return the security deposit in full or provide a list of damages and the cost of why they deducted that from the security deposit. Um, and the landlord has to do this. The clock starts ticking, essentially, as soon as the tenant provides possession and their new mailing address. Uh, possession is usually represented by handing over the keys to the unit. Uh, we can't really argue after that that the tenant has any more access. So 30 days starts from both of those things happening. Um, if that tenant has lived in that apartment for two or more years, the landlord is required to put it in an interest bearing account. And that interest also has to be included in the security deposit returned to the tenant. Um, if the landlord fails to give any sort of notice within that 30 days, I mean, I quite literally had a client who received the check like a day or two, probably after the 30 days. Um, at that point, on the 31st day, she had went and filed an MDJ court for um, the return of her security deposit. 
but since the landlord did not meet that 30-day requirement, it was very clear cut. We had the letters. She had um, text messages of when she sent him the, his her new mailing address, um, and the judge awarded her double her security deposit back. So it's a big fine. It's a it's a very easy thing to do. Just sending a letter, sending back a check. You have 30 days to do it. Um, but it's a, a quite an expense to the landlord if they don't follow through with um, the security deposit law because double the amount nowadays that could giving you, you know, $2,500 back. And I think we had a question there. Um, it's going to be if the lease term is for more than two years. Um, so if the tenant signs a month to month lease, but they've been living there for five, six years, a long period of time, um, the landlord by statute is not required to put it in an interest bearing account. It'd be probably best interest or like best practice to do it. Um, but it is if the lease term is for two or more years, essentially that statute of frauds requirement. Right. And it's not something we see too much because a lot of our leases aren't for that long. Um, but I've also never seen an interest bearing account. For a lease, uh, for a security deposit. Was there another question, Stephanie? Uh, no. Oh, okay. I would also like to say, just putting a, referencing that statute in a demand letter to a landlord is usually enough to scare them into sending back the security deposit as they should. <laughs> and I don't want to spend too much time on the next slide, um, but it's just a, a good typical example of a security deposit lease. There's not too much to say here. Uh, or security deposit clause, sorry. Um, but it says all of the same things, basically, Stephanie, just laid out. But we can move on. Um, not an issue come across very often, so I'm also not going to spend a, a lot of time on this. But um, if a landlord tenant sign a lease and the landlord is not, a, a not able to give possession of that new, um, of the newly signed lease, give possession of that leased apartment or unit, um, there's a couple different options that a tenant has. So if the tenant gave over, you know, um, a security deposit in first month's rent, that's their actual damages, they can sue to get those back. Um, rescission, the contract be canceled, and then restoring the tenant to pre-lease conditions. So that's gonna mean returning any prepaid rent. And then if there's the benefit of the bargain is gonna be any additional charges. So say they rented a U-Haul, they lost their per other current house that they moved out of. Um, the case cited there awarded a tenant quite a bit of damages um, because the landlord was unable to rent the unit that they contracted for. So it's not a bad idea in your leases if you're to drafting them um, to put in a provision saying, what if the landlord can't give possession? This is what will happen. Um, really just laying it out easy for the parties to understand. And on the flip side is if the tenant returns possession um, voluntarily is surrendering, uh, abandonment is more of the tenant has left and the landlord is not sure, you know, are they there? They don't really have any notice. Um, so in surrendering, that's going to be pretty voluntarily. Um, it could be in an eviction case too, where the tenant says, I'm moving out by the 31st. Um, they give it to you in writing. That's also best case scenario. Um, if the tenant is voluntarily surrendering the unit um, prior to the end of lease term, and it has to be the end, before the end of lease term, right? So if it's month to month and the tenant says, I'm moving out at the end of the month, um, the landlord cannot also collect rent for the continuing months. <laughs> but if the tenant you know, rented for a year, we're going to go back to that acceleration of rent or the mitigation of damages and re-renting the unit there on the Ralphie Daly case. Um, abandonment is what landlords I think have more of an issue with is um, like for example I have a client who often goes down to visit her family in Philly for weeks on end then the landlord thinks that she's abandoned the unit and they try to enter you're going to have to look at all of the facts around the case around the tenant's intent and that's what they're going to be the tenant's intent not the landlord's that's going to deem whether something a unit's been abandoned um, so there has been some good language put in leases I've seen you know, saying it's been more than 30 days, we haven't had any contact, you know, in this case, we're going to take these measures, these different steps of maybe writing notice, giving another 30 days before we could really deem it abandoned, 
and take and the landlord retake possession. Exculpatory clauses, uh, landlords love to write these in. They're more in the version of tenant is taking unit as is, uh, tenant will not hold liable, uh, landlord liable for any personal injury, you know, very broad disclaimers. <laughs> um, generally, and if you have poorly written lease, you know, there's nothing in there about that. And that's going to depend a lot on the type of injury the tenants um, sustained, where it happened, um, and how it happened. So, you know, common rooms versus in the private unit, um, their tort law can be applied to a landlord-tenant relationship. So just being aware that it's most likely going to be common spaces, you know, if something were to happen to a tenant, a landlord can be held liable. And you can't contract away someone's legal right for that to, to hold someone responsible. And that's going to be within this case. Um, they kind of went through the pros and cons here. It needs to be not a violation of public policy. If someone's writing a sculptory clause, you know, that whole any sort of reason for whatsoever is not going to hold up. Um, you can't contract away a landlord's right to keep safety equipment like smoke detectors in the unit. But possibly something smaller like dog bites in the unit by the tenant's own dog to the tenant himself that's not gonna be a landlord's responsibility. Right, and like Stephanie said, we see a lot of exculpatory clauses. Any landlord-friendly uh, lease is gonna have something like that in there, um, but they're attackable, you know, um, from an argument perspective. Again, it, the case says they cannot violate public policy, right? So you gotta look at the specific facts, see what they're trying to avoid, what liability they're trying to avoid, and see if that's, that's um, something that should happen, generally speaking, and you have arguments. Uh, briefly, subletting and assignments, something we also don't see very often, but to know that the default law is that if you don't put anything specific in the lease stating otherwise, a tenant can assign um, a lease if it doesn't say they can't. So, and subletting, there's a lot of rules. <laughs> and so I gave you the citation there, but mostly with the subletting and assignments language, if you're putting it in a lease and you want to have specific language to outline what people can and cannot do, um, the plain language statute and unfair trade practices from the beginning really try to, because the lay person won't understand the difference between subletting and assigning. So using terms like transfer and describing what type of transfer that is uh, would really keep, you know, it it take away a, a challenge to saying that term, that lease term is not, um, you know, enforceable because it's not plain language is not clear to a lay person. Um, so describing them in a way that a lay person could understand what's allowed and what's not allowed would be best, you know, best practice. And then there is a specific part in the Landlord Tenant Act about what tenants' rights are concerning guests. Um, there has been some interesting case law about tenants and the relation to criminal acts in the unit. So this is something we see pretty often. Some people might put in a lease. Um, a reason for eviction is illegal activities on the premise, which can be kind of vague. Um, you know, does illegal mean that they were using illegal drugs, or does that mean they were charged with using illegal drugs? And then were they charged or were they convicted? Um, so there's a lot of individual leeway depending on how the lease reads. Um, but there has been cases just because a tenant knows, I mean, sorry, tenant in their unit might have some sort of illegal drug activity happening, but if they don't know about it, the Woodland case held that they, that's not a reason for liability or eviction. And that case, I mean, often comes up to, in my situation is when there's, um, you know, a domestic violence victim who's not aware that her abuser is carrying a firearm and he's a convicted felon, so he's not allowed to do that. It's very illegal. But she's not part of that, right? She's not the one breaking the law and she doesn't know he's carrying. So that's not a reason to evict her. And when I think of use and occupancy or, or things a tenant can and can't do, you think of smoking, which is a hallmark example of that. But I also think of it in a quiet enjoyment context. Because what I get is a lot of calls from a tenant saying my neighbors in the apartment complex are smoking. I understand it's not smoking. And then we go to the lease 
we see if there's um, a, a clause that labels the apartment complex as a smoking complex, not smoking, and we approach the landlord about how to fix those things. So this is a good clause, I think. Um, some of them, some of the no smoking clauses are just, uh, you're liable for any smoking, don't do it. Fine, then that's okay, you could contract that. But this one specifically says smoking is prohibited in any area in or on the property, both private and common, whether enclosed or outdoors. And the policy applies to all owners, tenants, guests, employees, and service persons, so everybody. So it's a great no smoking clause in that um, the situation I described will be avoided in theory, or there'll be remedies for it, because even the owners um, can't be smoking on the property. Utilities um, also always included in a lease agreement, right? Um, if, I mean, if your lease premises is separately metered for all the utilities, landlord is free and able to charge a tenant for those. So they know exactly, you know, how much electric is metered, how much gas or water, how much their monthly sewer is for that unit. Um, it gets stickier when there's maybe a building and they're not separately metered. In that case, the landlord should not be charging, should not be guesstimating how much each unit is using. Um, the landlord should assume that payment and then calculate it breaking down on their own. I would say it's, it has to be precise. You can't you know, guesstimate it. <laughs> um, you should be able to tell how much each unit is using if you're gonna be charging them for that. So the issue that we usually see is that a landlord has failed, like, you know, it's the duty of the landlord to pay the utilities like water and sewer. But the tenants start receiving shutoff notices because those bills have not been paid. So if the tenants lose utilities, um, Ustra, that last act there on the bottom, can apply and the tenants can petition that utility service to reinstate their services. Um, and then it will become the landlord's duty still to, to start paying to re permanently um, restore that utility. But the tenants do have the right to petition, you know, kind of go around the landlord who has the contract with utility to restart services. And then it also requires a landlord, if they have multiple units in a building, or if it's just some sort of rental unit um, and they're they're not living there, it's a rental unit, they have to provide that information to the utility company. Utility companies need to know whether um, that unit is being rented or if it's for personal residential use. So that's another issue we see pretty often that we contact the water and sewer company or we contact Penelac and they're like saying, we didn't even know this was a rented unit, you know, because that provides the tenants in the building different rights than it would be if it was just a normal homeowner. Another fun one we get a lot, and, and I understand everyone wants to get paid, but if your lease does not allow expressly for attorney's fees to be granted um, in the case that a court case was filed and the landlord or tenant has attorney fees as a result of it, um, if it does not expressly allow that, you cannot collect attorney's fees. Um, and most often what we see is that the lease that the landlord gives the tenant is very landlord friendly saying the landlord's fees will be awarded and i agree to paying the landlord's attorney's fees if i lose the pennsylvania supreme court has consistently held that you know it has to be a mutual agreement it cannot be a one way it'd be unconscionable just for one party to be awarded fees it has to be a mutually award so whatever the prevailing party um, usually that's the language that the prevailing party can be reimbursed for attorney's fees, not just the landlord or not just the tenant has to be both of them. That's really important, that equally applicable um, bilateral type idea. It's something we miss a lot and it's, it's really important because judges are happy to give fees sometimes. Um, this is an example of a, attorney's, a particularly bad attorney's fees clause, not just because it's unilateral, but it goes a couple steps further. So it, it only provides the fees for the landlord, um, but it says if a landlord employs an attorney, um, it says uh, towards the bottom, it's a misspelling here, but resident will pay these legal fees upon demand, whether or not the landlord initiates a legal action. So just consulting with an attorney 
um, in this situation, uh, maybe drafting a letter or not even drafting a letter, just whatever consultation fee the tenant would be responsible for, which is not just unilateral, but it, it's wholly unconscionable, I would say. Um, and similarly, just to the end, um, they keep saying, you know, if, if no legal action is filed, the tenant is still on the hook for those fees if no legal action is filed, which is, um, again, taking it a, a step further. And I think this is a good example of an unenforceable attorney's fees clause. It simply just needs to be bilateral. The prevailing party might be entitled to attorney's fees. It's important to remember. Right of entry. Uh, this is another issue we have pretty often. Tenants call us saying, my landlord is showing up at my house at all hours of the day, not giving me any notice. Or uh, most recently, my landlord is sitting out in his truck across the yard and staring at me. And that was a fun one. So <laughs> tenants, once a landlord leases a property to a tenant, it says it's treated as if the tenant owns that home. So they have exclusive possession of the home, of that whole property, treated as if they're the landowners. Um, it's really, if your landlord client wants to have the right to entry, the right to do inspections, put that language in the lease expressly um, and put some sort of time period just so it's very clear. Um, if it's not for an emergency, it's just to do an inspection or show the premise to, you know, they're selling the property to selling it to new people, um, put in their reasonable times. Uh, traditionally, reasonable means 24 hours notice. So a text 24, 25 hours ahead of time saying, I wanna come look around the property tomorrow to see if you need some new drywall patches. That's all it takes. Just write it out very explicitly. Great communication <laughs> because there's a lot of case law su suggesting that tenants have the right to exclusive possession and landlords are infringing on that when they just show up all the times, all hours of the night um, to just for the sole purpose of harassing the tenants at that point. I think Two examples of that right to enter um, clause. This is a typical good one, I think. It gives um, the tenant, a, they can enter the apartment and make repairs, respond to requests, perform pest control. It gives the reasons that might be able to enter and then also the time frame. Right, which at the bottom of here, at least one day's notice, right? Like Stephanie said, is a reasonable amount of time. On the other hand, another right to enter clause here, you know, it's, a, it's a mouthful, but um, it gives six hours notice. The landlord shall provide tenants with six hours notice prior to entering said apartment. Um, tenants shall provide tenants, the landlord shall provide tenants with six hours notice to show the apartment. So imagine it's 10 at night and you get a text, I'll be there at, I don't know what, four in the morning. Um, it's wholly unreasonable, but it's contracted here. So it's something to just think about, you know, when you're, I, get, I know it's easier said than done, but at the outset when signing a lease, you want to make sure things like this are corrected um, because it's it's not clear. And then what, is that the basis for an eviction? Because you said no, um, six hours seems wholly unreasonable and, and the landlord hopefully would comply with the request to edit that. And we did have a question, um about advising clients to call the police if the landlord is showing up without any notice. Um, it kind of depends on the situation. You know, if it seems like a dangerous situation, um, if there's harassment, there's any sort of physical violence threatened, you know, that's a situation for police. Um, I'm hoping it's not escalating to that point automatically, but we ask clients to keep track of when, you know, keep those text messages or write down when that phone call was a landlord saying they're gonna show up, what time they actually show up, you know, and how long are they there for? Are they sitting out front of your apartment for 12 hours? That's that's not okay. Um, if they're texting you and then coming in a couple hours later to repair something, you know, it's, it's gonna be a situational call for that. It's um, definitely and situational. And, and the concern is sometimes, you know, overcalling because landlords think they can come a lot or something like that. And you call the police every time. Now you've worn down the, the police's response, you know, or sympathy. So you gotta, you gotta weigh, like Stephanie said, the specific situation there. Um, and that goes hand in hand with care and maintenance of the property. Um, landlords can enter to do maintenance on the home. So even if your lease does not expressly say it's been pretty, it's been held that your security deposit realm, at least that anything that's reasonable wear and tear is not the tenant's responsibility to fix and be charged for. Um, What's beyond reasonable wear and tear, uh, probably broken windows, broken down doors, holes in the wall, um, that could be outside of reasonable wear and tear. Um, if the refrigerator breaks, that's a landlord duty to come fix, right? 
it's probably old, it's been there for a couple of tenants, that's the landlord's responsibility. And I mean, this is quite, it was before um, Proovy Homes, but the Reitmeyer case held that caveat emperor, you know, you're buying as is, buyer beware, no longer applies to vital consumer commodities like shelter. So tenants are protected, even if that lease says tenant is taking property as is, it doesn't waive that um, tenant's right to have a safe, habitable home, and it doesn't waive that landlord's responsibility to come fix certain things. So can't go this whole time without mentioning Fruity Homes, but it really established the warranty of habitability in Pennsylvania. So not only did it state that contract law applies to all leases, but habitability will cover, and it very explicitly lists out what that means. And there's been a couple of cases after where that's added on to it. So Prue really added that, you know, it has to be fit for basic human sanitation. You know, it can't have, um, you have to have running water, hot water, heat in the winter time. Um, anything that you feel codes is going to condemn your house for is probably falls under habitability. <laughs> uh, the Beasley case added vermin and being waterproof. If we have some consistent landlords who are unable to secure the house, you know, we have tenants who have rats living around and not just in the attic, but throughout the house. That's a violation. Um, and it does not matter if you don't include this language in the lease, or even if you put a nice waiver statement saying, I waive my rights to habitability, that's unenforceable, it's void. Uh, this is every landlord tenant lease is stuck with its provisions in Pennsylvania. Um, for a tenant to enforce um, the warranty of habitability on a court case, you know, the first thing we have to prove is that they gave notice to the landlord of those defects. And it doesn't specify, the case does not specify that it has to be in writing. So best case scenario is that you did put it in writing because that makes great court evidence, right? But a lot of times our tenants are calling their landlords, you know, they're not necessarily writing them nice legal demand letters saying the furnace stopped working or my water stopped running. Um, you're going to more often see phone call or a text message, nothing very formal, but any sort of notice works. And then you have to give the landlord time to repair. So a reasonable opportunity, that's going to be based on the situation. You know, if it's July and your furnace isn't running, you can, you know, a couple of months is fine to give them the chance to repair it. Um, if we're at Christmas time and we don't have a working furnace, a week might be considered, um, you know, reasonable because you really can't go in the winter time without heat sources. Um, water is probably even less time because you need water all year round. So we try to give the landlord the time period that they could reasonably fix something before you take that issue into court. And so if the warranty of habitability has been breached, they've given notice, there's been no repair, the tenant has a couple options and these are laid out in that pro case. So they can terminate the lease. Um, and then this is not, they can terminate it, you know, move for somewhere else, but they can still uh, reply and apply all these other remedies, um, including the suit for damages. So even if they move out, we can still sue the landlord for what the tenant lost in habitability or use of their home. Um, sometimes we recommend that the tenant repair and deduct. So if it's something like a simple fix, they can do that repair themselves. Um, say they replace a piece of the furnace that costs them $50 and their rent is $750 a month. The next month would say on that and a letter stuck with the rent saying, I charge this, here's a copy of my receipt, and that's why I'm not giving you the full month's rent. Um, it's a really best practice for the tenant to do this um, ahead of time. So, right, you're going to give that opportunity to repair. You're going to tell the landlord, if you don't fix this by this date, I'm going to do it myself. And then you can afterwards, after you repair it, take that expense, show how much it was, and deduct it from your monthly rent. Um, never spend more than one month's rent on a repair. That's usually something pretty substantial. And that's something that the landlord should really be fixing for a unit to be habitable. Um, and then damages that can be compensatory or um, even some I, not IED, uh, but uh, emotional distress. There's been cases that held, you know, the added stress to the tenant on top of the actual damages 
they've won uh, those damages in a suit. So just the mute, just have the landlords fix things, right? It's the easier, cheaper way to deal with things. Um, if uh, the notice and time to repair does not result in a repair, we have filed injunctive relief in cases where the court has then ordered landlords to fix things within a certain time period or else be in violation of court orders. Um, the withhold, withholding rent is a, usually a favorite tenants, right? Saying, I'm not going to pay my rent if my house is not habitable. They can do that, but it's best practice to give notice before you do that. Um, and then warranty of habitability claims have also been held to go under the Unfair Trade Practices um, Act. So if a landlord is consistently saying, I'm going to fix something or denying fixing something and just giving this um, kind of false sense of change or repairs that's required, um, we have applied that and won in injunctive relief cases. Um, so just, and, and the reason the UTCP is so important is because it allows for triple damages. So if the, the tenant is uh, one month of rent that a house was not habitable because I didn't have water, the UTCP allows us to ask for three times that amount of damages. So that's going to be three months worth of rent or possibly three times worth of whatever extra they spent on buying bottled water that month. Um, so it can really punish the landlords for not making repairs. And again, and at um, this time, I'm going to interrupt and launch the second poll, if that's okay. I'm going to be up for two minutes. Thank you both. You're doing a fantastic job. Let's try that poll. Um, so again, the Fair v. Negley case is um, you cannot waive the warranty of habitability, right, which is something we see landlords try to do all the time in the lease clauses. I, I mean, there's... Uh, unlimited examples in the leases I reviewed of these, but here's a particularly bad one. Um, tenant agrees that if they continue to occupy the property, it is habitable and they must pay rent and all payments as they become due. A tenant may not claim that the property is uninhabitable unless a government official or licensed inspector has determined so. Um, if a tenant does not vacate the premises, then all payments are still due on the specified date, may not be withheld. Okay, if property is determined uninhabitable, the landlord will not provide alternative housing. And then if the tenant claims property is uninhabitable but does not vacate, it's a violation of the lease and they could evict. So not only if the landlord does not do what they're supposed to do, they can evict um, that person. Um, and again, this is wholly illegal and uh, against Fair v. Negley and Pew, right? So and you can't waive the warranty of habitability. So it's something we see a lot, and it's just something to, to be mindful of. Um, that's a clear example of an illegal waiver. A less clear example here, um, a landlord will not be responsible for providing alternative housing in the event of utility favor, failure, heat failure, or leak of any kind. And the landlord will not reimburse any expenses incurred by tenant in the event of a utility heat or leak. Um, so again, that's a, a more masked version of a waiver of habitability can't do it. Um, the tenant has rights um, and they may be compensated if the property is no longer habitable. We mentioned pests, vermin, rodents, right? Um, that is also under the landlord's responsibilities under the warranty of habitability, right? This one, it's a little bit more of a fair clause, right? Um, if the tenant is the tenant is responsible for any pest extermination. This is included to, but not limited to mice, rats, squirrels, cockroaches, fleas. If the pests were present at the property prior to move-in, the landlord is responsible. The tenant can ask the landlord to remove pests and the cost will be added to the tenant's balance. So the fair part there is that if they were present before the landlord's responsible, the not fair part is that future pests are automatically the tenant's responsibility, because that's not true, right? If squirrels or you know whatever mice burrow in um, during the tenant's uh, tenancy, it's the landlord's responsibility to fix that, okay? Um, similarly here, another clause at the end, the tenant shall notify the landlord of any pest control problem, and it's the tenant's responsibility to mitigate it. The tenant must notify the landlord, no, sorry, not that part, but so it's not really the tenant's responsibility to mitigate it, to get it fumigated or um, exterminators out. It's the landlord's responsibility, okay, which falls squarely under the warranty of habitability. Smoke alarms, 
are a big thing um, and it's required, right? That the landlord provides smoke alarms for obvious reasons. Um, the first clause uh, waives that requirement by the landlord, right? Um, it's the tenant's responsibility. It's the tenant's responsibility to keep batteries. That's not true, right? The, the landlord has to do that. The, the last one here, smoke alarms and fire extinguishers, colon, needed as per codes enforcement officer. That was in a lease. That was a clause. It wasn't, I don't know, it, it's hard to read. A good, another good example of a lack of communication. Uh, it's not clear if they're needed now, like if they need to be put in because the codes enforcement officer said so, or if um, they're generally just following code enforcement. So that's an example of a poor, poorly drafted clause. This is another um, of my college, um, from my college lease. Um, it, here at the bottom, for some reason, it looks like we waived the requirement that the landlord keep our property safe, um, except we can't tamper with anything. Uh, the tenant agrees to check the fire detectors and fire extinguishers. It's our responsibility to keep them. It was all crossed out and we had a sign there. So again, it, it's not waivable. It's part of the habitability. Um, I also included it because Part C here says uh, tenants agree to hold no cake parties on the lease premises. Um, just something you'll only see in a college lease, I think. And then here, appliances. Um, uh, it, it's good to dictate and, and make clear what the landlord's providing. Um, things that might not squarely fit under the warranty of habitability, but things that the tenant may have a right to. Um, here it says landlords not obligated to replace any appliances if broken or cease to work, which may be true, right? And it may be okay under the warranty of habitability. It depends on what the appliance is. Um, like Stephanie said, a furnace has to be replaced. Um, and I know we're running short on time, so we'll kind of speed through a little bit here at the end, but the covenant quiet enjoyment, it goes hand in hand with warranty of habitability. Um, essentially, the tenant has the right to full use and possession of the property. So if they don't have heat in half the house, they're losing that enjoyment of half the house. Um, and that's kind of how we would determine damages as well. So there's a couple of good case laws cited in there for you to kind of go through and determine if you think you have a tenant or a landlord who have substantially impaired their use of the property. Um, and it goes through what damages they can collect. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this because this is pretty clear cut, whether someone has good use of the house. <laughs> and then this is an example of uh, a quiet enjoyment issue, I think. Um, you could just look at like how this kind of clause appears. Who's going to read through all of this, right? Um, if Even if I were to see this, at, a, at least maybe um, I would just sign off on it, not think about it. But this seeks to define quiet hours, which shall commence from 10, until, 10 p.m. until 7 a.m. But that also includes no television, right? So you can't play your TV technically by the terms of this lease from 10 to 7 in your own home, right? So how could that be a violation of the lease? That, that has to be a breach of your quiet enjoyment rights. Um, some of the other stuff, fireworks, firecrackers, makes sense. But that that's just a small nuance um, that it goes to show you need to read everything very carefully. Um, and copies of this PowerPoint will be given out to everyone afterwards, after you attend today. So all these citations, all the remaining slides will end up to you. Um, if you want to base some of your leases, you're drafting off these provisions. Um, we do have slides for your remedies for breach of lease. Um, and kind of walking through if you want to terminate a lease, what kind of notice is required and what is required for notice to quit, uh, making it very clear and decisive about dates of move out. Um, we also included towards the end exactly the civil procedure requirements for starting an MDJ court and then your options of appealing that or starting in the court of common pleas. So I don't, and we are at time now, so I just wanna give everyone the opportunity. We do have another question in the chat box, but if anyone else has questions, please add them in there.